This podcast is made possible by our supporters on Patreon, who pledge an amount to contribute every month and in return get exclusive access to bonus content, merchandise discounts, and much more. If you'd like to join our family and help us continue to bring you the very best in audio drama, please go to patreon.com slash Gotham Variety and subscribe. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N slash Gotham Variety. And now, from New York, the Gotham Variety Podcast in a unique series of theatrical productions. And here's your producer and host, Joe Rubenstein. Greetings and welcome to the second episode of Gotham Variety. And tonight, we present not one story, but seven, all by Franz Kafka. Ever faced a difficult situation with an uncertain outcome and asked yourself, okay, what's the worst case scenario? I think most of us have done that. Well, Kafka's body of work, three novels and over 70 stories, might be described as a series of fascinating uh, worst-case scenarios, scenarios blending reality and fantasy, featuring isolated, often nameless protagonists caught up in surreal predicaments, grappling with insane bureaucracies, persecuted by forces beyond their control, all of it packaged in some of the most perfect prose ever set to paper, not a wasted word, and much of it surprisingly funny. So buckle up for something truly unique, something dark and well off the beaten path. Seven by Kafka, right after this. You can follow us on Twitter, at Gotham Variety, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. We're on Spotify as well. Check out our website at GothamVariety.com, where you can send us your comments and questions. And if you love what we're doing, we'd love a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice. Reviews and ratings help keep our show on the charts, so more and more people can find us. Before the Law Before the Law stands a gatekeeper. To this gatekeeper comes a man from the country, who asks permission to enter the law. I can't grant you entry now. Will I be allowed to enter later? It's possible, but not now. The entrance to the law stands open, as usual. As the gatekeeper steps aside, the man peers through the gate, into the interior. (laughs) Tempted. Go on then. Enter without permission. But know this. I'm powerful, and I'm the least of the gatekeepers. From room to room, there are more of us, each mightier than the last. The third gatekeeper, for example, just the sight of him is so terrifying, even I can't bear to look. But... Go on, speak up, man. I was only going to ask if the law shouldn't be accessible to everyone. But you thought better of it, yes? Well, perhaps I'll wait for permission. Perhaps, did you say? Yes. Thank you. All right, then. The gatekeeper, who wears a fur coat and has a sharp nose and long black beard, gives him a stool and lets him sit just to the side of the entrance. And there he sits for days. For years. He makes many attempts to be let in. No, not yet. Will you at least admit that I've been very patient? I'll admit to nothing of the kind. What is it you want, anyway? Be precise. I'll be very precise. And you'll note that I continue to ask respectfully. May I please enter the law? Oh, right. Then I may enter? No. And the reason? I'm sorry, reason? Is that what you said? Yes, the reason for your refusal. (sighs) Look, why don't you tell me... I don't know, tell me about... where you're from. I've described it before. Have you? Yes, many, many times. Well, be that as it may, I can't let you in. Not yet, anyway. Then when? I say, these constant requests are very tiring. Why don't you sit down like a good fellow? The man, well equipped for his journey, resolves to bribe the gatekeeper, gradually giving away all his possessions, no matter how valuable. What's this? The last of my gold pieces. Well, (sighs) I'll take them, but only for your own peace of mind. Wouldn't want you to think you haven't tried absolutely everything. And may I enter? No. Over the years, the man has observed the gatekeeper with singular focus. He has, in fact, forgotten the other gatekeepers. This one seems to him the only obstacle to entering the law. 
In the early years, the man cursed his fate loudly. But as the years turn to decades, and he advances into old age, he only mumbles to himself. It's... what day is it? Oh, what's the difference? It's all the same day. He is by now well acquainted with the fleas in the gatekeeper's collar, and childishly asks them for assistance. I can't do it myself. That much is clear. But with you on my side, pleading my case, then... maybe. That'll be quite enough of that. May I enter? You may not. Eventually, his eyesight begins to fade. Has the world grown dark? Or is it my eyes playing tricks on me? But now he sees within the darkness an unquenchable light shining forth from the entrance to the law. He hasn't much longer to live. All of his countless experiences before the law now converge into a single point, a question he has not yet asked. He waves feebly at the gatekeeper, unable to move his stiffening body. The gatekeeper stoops low to hear him, as their size difference has increased, much to the man's disadvantage. What is it now? You really are insatiable. Everyone strives after the law. So, why is it that during all these years, no one but me has asked for admission? That's easy. No one else could enter here. What? Speak louder, man. I can't hear you. No one else could enter here because this entrance was designed only for you. And now, with your death, the entrance is closed. Resolutions Lifting oneself out of a miserable mood should be easy, even without strength of will. I force myself out of my chair, walk around the table, stretch my head and neck, make my eyes sparkle, tightening the muscles around them, struggle with my feelings, welcome A enthusiastically should he come to see me, tolerate B kindly in my room, <laughs> swallow everything said by C, despite the pain and trouble it may cost me. But even if I do all that, one small slip, which is practically inevitable, brings the whole process to a halt, and I'm thrown back on myself again. So the best advice I can give is to accept everything, to become a silent, immovable mass. And if you feel yourself being moved, don't take a single unnecessary step. Look at others with the eyes of an animal. Feel no remorse. Push down with your hand upon any remaining ghost of life within you. In short, amplify the peace of the graveyard, letting nothing survive except for that. A characteristic movement of such a condition is to run one's little finger over the eyebrows. The Knock at the Manor Gate It was summer, a hot day. With my sister, I was passing the gate of a great house on our way home. I don't know whether she knocked on the gate out of high spirits, absent-mindedness, or maybe she just threatened with her fist and didn't knock at all. But as soon as we passed the house, some townspeople gathered before us, making friendly or warning signs, bent low with terror. Excuse me, let us through, please. They pointed to the house we had just passed. She knocked. And what if she did? The owner will charge you. The interrogation will begin immediately. Interrogation? But I didn't do anything. You knocked. She knocked. But... All right, calm down. I'll handle this. Now, I'm not admitting she knocked. But for the sake of argument, let's say that she did. She She did. She did. She did. Certainly nowhere in the world would that be reason for prosecution. That's... Not for us to decide. But you do realize that as her brother, you'll be charged as well. I nodded and smiled. We all looked back at the house, as one watches a distant smoke cloud and waits for the flames to appear. Who's that? The authorities. They approached in a cloud of dust which covered all but the tips of their spears. Go home. I'll take care of this. No, I won't leave you here alone. Well... At least change, so you'll be better dressed before the authorities. All right. 
She started on the long road home. When the authorities finally arrived, the leader spoke without dismounting. Where's your sister? She's not here at the moment. No? No. She'll come later. (laughs) They seemed almost indifferent, as if finding me was the important thing. I was asked to enter the house. I began to move slowly, hunching my shoulders, the sharp eyes of the townspeople watching my every step. I still almost believed that a word from one of them would suffice to free me, a city dweller and a man of honor. But when I crossed the threshold and entered the house, the judge jumped up as if he'd been expecting me and said, For this man, I am truly sorry. And it was beyond all doubt that by this, he didn't mean my present condition, but something that would happen to me. I was taken to a room more like a prison cell than a parlor. Large stone tiles, bare dark wall, with an iron ring encased in the middle. And in the center of the room, something that was half bed, half operating table. Could I breathe any air other than prison air? That is the great question. Or rather, it would be if I had any prospect of release. The neighbor. My business rests completely on my own two shoulders. Desk, chair, conference table, telephone, safe. That's my whole setup. Easy to keep track of, easy to manage. I'm very young, plenty of business rolling in, so no complaints. No complaints. That's him. Since the new year, a man's been renting the adjoining office. I almost took it myself, but I hesitated, and by then it was too late. Similar setup to mine, but a kitchen as well. What do I want with a kitchen? At any rate, it was just this minor reservation that kept me from renting it. So now, this young man has it. Harris, that's his name. What he actually does in there, I don't know. The sign on the door just says, Harris Bureau. Hello? Reception? Uh, Yes. Uh, Would you mind telling me, what is the Harris Bureau? Excuse me? The Harris Bureau, the office next to mine. What is it? (laughs) The Harris Bureau? Yes, Harris Bureau. Harris Bureau. I'll connect you. No, no, no. Stop. Did I... Hello? Hello? Yes, how can I help you? Did I ask you to connect me? You don't wish to be connected? No, I do not. I do not. What I would like, quite simply, is some information regarding the Harris Bureau. Please hold. I can't exactly warn people about this fellow if I don't know what he does, can I? I'm not saying he has no future. I mean, he's young, he's motivated, driven. Well, all right, I'll give him that too, but I can hardly recommend him at this point. I don't even know if he has any assets. Sir? Yes? Hello? Yes, I'm here. It's a business similar to yours. Similar to... I'm sorry, could you please repeat that? It's a business similar to yours. I... uh, I don't understand. The Harris Bureau. It's a business similar to yours. No, that's... that's impossible. I mean, how in the world would he know anything about what I do? Sir, would you like me to connect you? No, I... uh, No. No, that can't be right. It's the usual sort of thing people say when they don't really know anything. They're misinformed, obviously. Badly misinformed. But by whom? Oh. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. That's... N- n- <laughs> no, that's very good, Harris. No, that really is quite... You see, I've underestimated him. I run into him on the stairs, you know. Always in the most incredible rush, he shoots right past in a blur. Yes, always has his office key in his hand, poised, ready for use, and then back in his hole, like a rat. And me, I'm left standing there, once again, staring at that sign. 
Harris Bureau. A sign I've read far more often than it deserves. You see, these walls, they're terribly thin. Thin walls expose the honest and protect the wicked, that's what I always say. Which is why I'm extra careful about naming my clients when I speak to them. Not that it makes much of a difference, of course. I mean, for someone like Harris, it would take no effort at all to determine who they were by certain turns of conversation and then the keeping of diligent records. The truth is, I can't help divulging secrets no matter what I do. And so this is why... Sometimes on the phone, my voice becomes shaky. I seem unsure of myself, and so, yes, the damage is truly impossible to calculate. What is Harris doing while I'm on the phone? Yes, I've often wondered. If I wanted to exaggerate a bit, but I think one must exaggerate at times in order to be clear, don't you? I could say, for example, that Harris doesn't need a telephone at all. He uses mine. You see? He pushes his chair up against the wall and listens. Now, what you must understand, and he understands all too well, is that when the telephone rings, I must answer it. And then I have to pay close attention to the needs of my clients. I have to think, I have to calculate, I have to make large-scale business decisions. But is that what I'm really doing? Of course not. No, what I'm really doing is reporting to Harris. I can't help myself. You see? Harris is, in effect, my supervisor. Lately, I've been thinking he doesn't even bother to wait for the end of my conversations. No, at the precise moment he's sufficiently informed, he sneaks out of the office with his rat-like tail, and before I've even hung up the phone, he's out there, flying through the city, working towards his goal. My destruction. An Imperial Message The Emperor, it is said, has sent you, the humble subject, the insignificant shadow cowering in the distance before the Imperial Sun, a message. From his deathbed, the Emperor has sent a message to you alone. He had the messenger kneel by his bed and whispered it in his ear. So important was the message that the Emperor ordered the messenger to whisper it back confirming it with a nod of his head. Before witnesses, before the highest ranks of the realm circled around him, he has sent you this message. The messenger, a strong, tireless man, leaves at once. Extending his powerful arms, he makes his way through the crowd. When he encounters resistance, he points to his chest, which bears the sign of the Imperial Sun. In so doing, his journey is made easier than anyone else's could ever be. But the crowd is huge, its numbers never-ending. If only he could travel through open fields, how fast he would fly, this messenger! How soon you would hear the magnificent knock of his fist upon your door! But his struggles are in vain. He's still squeezing through the chambers of the innermost palace. He'll never get through. And even if he did, nothing would be gained, for he'd have to fight his way down the stairs. And if he succeeded in that, there would be vast courtyards to cross. And after the courtyards, the second enclosing palace. And then more stairs, and more courtyards, and another palace, on and on for thousands of years. And if he finally burst through the outer gate... But never, never can that happen. The Imperial City would lie before him, the center of the world, full to bursting with its very dregs. No one could penetrate here, even with the message of a dead man. But there you sit at your window, and dream it as the evening comes. The Vulture A vulture was hacking at my feet. It had already torn up my boots and stockings, and now it was hacking at the feet themselves. It struck them again and again, 
restlessly circled around me several times and then continued its work. Get off of me! A man came by and watched for a while. Get off! Tell me, why do you tolerate the vulture? I'm defenseless. When it first started to hack at me, of course I tried to drive it away. I even tried to strangle it. But these animals are very powerful. It wanted to attack my face, so I offered my feet instead. But now, as you can see, they're just about torn to pieces. Incredible. How you allow yourself to be tormented like this. One shot and the vulture is done. Really? Would you help me then? All I have to do is go home and get my rifle. Can you wait another half hour? I don't know, the pain is excruciating. But let's try it in any case. All right. I'll hurry. All the while, the vulture had been listening quietly to our conversation, its pitiless gaze wandering back and forth between me and the man. And then I realized it had understood everything. Without a word, the vulture flew up, leaning far back to gain momentum, and then, like a javelin thrower, plunged its beak through my mouth, deep inside of me. And falling back, I was relieved to feel it drowning in my blood, which was filling every depth, flooding every shore. At night... Deeply lost in the night, as one sometimes lowers one's head to reflect, so to be utterly absorbed by the night. All around, people sleep, but it's only play acting, innocent self-delusion that they sleep in houses, in safe beds, under a safe roof, stretched out or curled up on mattresses, in sheets, under blankets. In fact, they've come together as they once did, and then did again, in wilder regions. An open-air camp, an immensity of numbers, an army, a people, cold skin on cold earth, having thrown themselves down where once they stood, foreheads pressed to their arms, faces against the ground, breathing quietly. And you are watching. You're one of the watchmen. You find the next one by brandishing a burning stick from a pile of wood beside you. Why are you watching? Someone must watch, it is said. Someone must be there. In tonight's cast, James Evans, you can always identify James from his British accent, Brian Alford, Vince Phillip, Sarah Ecton Luttrell, Samuel Druhora, Paulina Simkin, and Hallie DeVestern. The stories were adapted by yours truly. I did stay pretty faithful to the originals, with the exception of The Neighbor, which I expanded to about twice its original length, maybe more, and I added the part of the receptionist in that story. Some of the music for Before the Law, our first story, was composed by Gustavo Becerra Schmidt. Resolutions, our second story, featured a piece by George Frederick Handel called The Arrival of the Queen of Sheba, performed by the Advent Chamber Orchestra, and I did the music for the remainder and all the sound as well. Final thoughts right after this. Your feedback is important to us. On Twitter, at Gotham Variety, 
on our Facebook page, or you can email the program, joe at gothamvariety.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. And if you'd like to join our family and get exclusive access to bonus content, please go to patreon.com slash gothamvariety and subscribe. Kafka's work was largely unknown to the public. During his brief lifetime, he died of tuberculosis in 1924 at the age of 41, predeceasing both of his parents, who died in the 1930s, and his three sisters as well, all three killed in the Holocaust. But 25 years after his death, Kafka was already being recognized as one of the major literary figures of the 20th century, due in large part to the efforts of his friend Max Brode, who thankfully disobeyed Kafka's deathbed order to burn all of his unpublished manuscripts. Uh, Brode later claimed that Kafka asked him specifically to do this, to burn the work, because he knew that Brode would never do it. Um, And what a loss if he had. But If you were previously unfamiliar with Kafka's work, I hope that this little uh, sampler has captured your interest and that you go on to read more of it or all of it. You really can't go wrong. Uh, The Collected Stories and the three novels, America, The Trial, and The Castle, are all excellent, and his letters and diaries, um, all published in book form, a fact that would probably have horrified Kafka if he knew about it. He was uh, he was a very shy, introverted man with uh, deep insecurities, but uh, the diaries and letters do shed a good deal of light on the inner life of this troubled but enormously gifted genius of literature. Well, it's time to close. Thanks so much for joining us here on Gotham Variety. We'll see you back here on October 1st for episode three. Take care. Mm -hmm.